happy tonight to have Susan Tilly from FAIR with us, the Federation for American Immigration Reform. She's come all the way from Washington, D.C. We had a great time at lunch this afternoon solving the problems of the world. She joined the FAIR staff in 2002. She is a former business owner and manager for municipal code enforcement, immigration coordinator for the Coalition of Government Officials in Southern California, and president of Citizens Committee for Immigration Policy. Susan manages FAIR's extensive and national field program. She develops members and activist support and educates the media and public on immigration issues. She is a resident of Wisconsin with that great Republican Governor Scott Walker. Without further ado, Susan, it's yours. sanctuary laws, uh, AB 450 and SB um, 54. I'll talk to you tonight about is why sanctuary policy is a deadly <coughs> proposition. And I mean that in the very sense of the word. But before we go there, I want to talk to you a little bit about legal immigration in the United States because I think it's important for you to, to understand the issue kind of in a broad sense. The United States is the most welcoming nation in the world when it comes to legal immigration. We grant more than a million green cards. Green card means they're permanent residents. More than a million each and every year. That is more permanent immigration than the whole rest of the world combined. We give legal immigration to more people than the whole rest of the world combined each and every year. We take in 75% of the world's refugee population each and every year. Now, how do we get illegal immigrants here? Well, some of them cross the border, but about 40% are actually legal immigrants who come on visas. They can be a variety of work visas, study visas, whatever, uh, visitor visas, but they never go home. Now, why is that? Because <laughs> After 9-11, uh, one of the things that the 9-11 Commission said was we need an entry program and we need an exit program. Well, we developed both, but we only implemented one, and that's the entry program. So we check people in, but we never, never check them out. <coughs> How many of you travel to Europe or any other country? Do you foreign travel? Do you get checked in to the EU? And do they ask you when you're leaving? Yes. And so do they check you out when you leave? Yes, they do. We do not. So about 40% of the 13 to, who knows, 20 million, 30 million, nobody knows what that number really is. It's kind of scary, isn't it? Uh, people who are here illegally just simply never went home. Now, as a result of this very generous legal immigration, forget the illegal immigration right now, but generous legal immigration, the United States is growing in a faster population than China. Think about that. It's not our birth rate, it's our migration rate. And you can go on the UN website, take a look at it. It's been the case for over 10 years now. So what happens? I mean, nobody, we can speculate all day long, but exponentially as we grow. I left the state of California 20 years ago, there were 30 million people here. Today there's 40 million. You've grown by 25% in 20 years. So projections are we could be in upwards of 1 billion people in 100 years if we don't do something about immigration. So what we need to talk about in this country is immigration policy. Is this where the United States wants to go? China hit a billion people, they instituted forced abortion, emphasized one child family. Is it because they're tyrants? Some people would say so, but I'd say if you listen to them, he said it was because of resource. Now you know, all know very well here in the state of California about resource. You have grown by an extra 10 million people in 20 years. You have had to institute all kinds of water issues because you have a real drought problem from time to time. Right now I guess you're 
you're doing pretty well. <coughs> but there are laws that they're passing that's talking about having to limit the water usage to 55 gallons per day per person. What happens if you grow another 10 million people? What will that number then go down to? Do you see what I'm saying? So until we talk about immigration, and our people like to talk about our carbon footprint, well, how does the United States ever get ahead of the carbon footprint when people are the biggest cause of the carbon footprint? So where, is the, where are the jobs coming from? Where are the foods coming from? Where is the water resource coming from? Where is all of this resource coming from when immigration seems to be the single driving force that this country talks about, especially today? So these are things in terms of educating ourselves about where we're headed. This is a runaway train we could stop if we need to, but we can't. If we can't dialogue, if we can't talk about this without all of the emotion that seems to go with this, and somehow you are just a person who is called a name, and always with the ending of IST, racist, protectionist, isolationist, nationalist, go down the list. If you want to talk about immigration and talk about, we need to possibly put the brakes on. <coughs> now, there are some huge costs that come with illegal immigration, of course. They're financial. But they're more than that. And we're going to talk about what the other part of that, besides the financial. Nationally, the United States spends each and every year about $113 billion on illegal immigrants. Now, when you hear them crying about building the wall, and you say, oh my god, it's going to cost 45 to $65 billion. That's a one-time investment that should end a lot of what we're talking about. This is $113 billion each and every year that we spend. 75% of it comes at the state and local level. So what happens? And the majority of it, 52%, is on the education K through 12. In your state, it's K through college, because you can state tuition as well. Californians, you have the single highest population of illegal immigrants in the United States. And you, it is costing you, each native household in this state, over $2,200 each and every year. Each one of you, your homes, that's what it's costing you. Now, they pay taxes, that's what you hear. Yes, they do. But the federal government, remember, only pays about 20, picks up about 25% of the bill. They actually cover about a third of their expenditures in some sort of form of a tax. But state and local governments only recover less than 5%, and that's where 75% of the costs come from. So when you hear them say, argue that they pay taxes, they do. They pay sales tax, gasoline tax, you know, all of the other everyday taxes, even property tax. Some of them file some form of an income tax, but um, many of them have to be on a social security number, so that means they committed identity theft or they're using some bogus social security number, if they do. <coughs> now the important message tonight that I want to tell you about is what happens at the border doesn't stay at the border. But more importantly, what happens across the border doesn't stay across the border anymore either. So what does that mean? We have an uncontrolled perimeter, folks. Can you be a sovereign nation if you can't control your borders? What makes you a sovereign nation? Say this belongs to us, we get to control it, we get to decide who comes and goes. So without that, I mean, the first thing that happens at a crime scene is the police secure the perimeter, don't they? Um, military action, any kind of military action, they secure their perimeter. We aren't securing our perimeter. Why do I say that? Because we only have 13% operational control of our border, 13%. And so if you take the, we actually have 7,500 miles of border if you count the islands and all of the ports. But <coughs> land mass, there's the continental United States, about 6,000. That's about 780 miles that we actually have operational control over. 
So, just to take that one step, we have about 19,000 Border Patrol agents for that entire distance, for so that whole 7,500 miles of border that we have to protect. On the interior of the United States, inside, we have ICE, Immigration Customs Enforcement. We have 12,000 officers employed by ICE. 6,000 who do special investigations, and 6,000 that do removals. I want you to compare both Border Patrol with 19,000 agents and ICE with 12,000 agents to the city of New York that has between 65,000 and 70,000 sworn police officers in any given order. Do you think we're serious about protecting our borders? So let's talk. If we don't control our southern border, who does? And specifically? The Metro Cartel, the gang, Correct. Cartel. The Mexican drug cartels. We don't control who comes and goes, but they do. Make no mistake. Every one of those unaccompanied minors that are coming through the southern border, they come in groups. They're coming with a coyote. And their families have to pay between four and eight thousand dollars per person to get them across the border. Some of them pay it up front, but some of them have to pay it after they get here. But the, the drug cartels see this as a business venture. It enhances their drug trafficking. Nobody gets through that border that hasn't paid for access. Nobody. And you can talk to the border patrol agents down in Gallon, Texas. Laredo, Texas, you know, El Paso, anywhere, they will all tell you the same. So, <coughs> if we don't have control of our southern border, the drug cartels do. And the people can come at the rate of 55,000 a month, which they currently are, 55,000 a month. <coughs> what else comes through the border, along with those people? Disease, disease, OGMs, criminals, just anything they want to bring. If you can get 55,000 people, or you know, um, annually, upwards of who knows? It's kind of like a revolving door. Nobody really knows what that number is. But you, along with that comes drug trafficking, <laughs> comes human trafficking, comes na transna transnational gangs. Right. Anything that they want to bring. So what do you see to Kamala Harris and others who have said, <coughs> maybe we should rethink how we use ICE. Maybe we should, you know, let's just, I mean, lately, this whole week, we've heard, open the border, let them in. Let them in. When we know that, in fact, there are thousands People who are coming here who are drug trafficking, <coughs> human trafficking, transnational gangs. Why would we do that? I wish I had my PowerPoint here tonight right now to <coughs> show you what those maps look like. Then I can show you the next map that shows the DEA, who shows the cartels and how they've divvied up <coughs> the drug trade in the United States. The Sinaloa cartel are the biggest purveyors of drug trafficking into the United States. <coughs> and other than tax Texas and New Mexico, they control almost exclusively the drug trade in the United States. And they have routes that go through the United States and then even over to Europe. The drug cartels rent satellite time from the Russians and the Chinese. We, the drug trafficking trade by the Mexican drug cartels is somewhere between $200 billion to $700 billion a year. Do you know what Mobile Exxon makes in oil per year? About 237 billion. So we're talking an amazing amount of money that the cartels have. And these guys aren't the tattooed crazy people that you see the pictures of. These guys are high tech. They are recruiting people with college educations who they need for IT, doctors, um, engineers. Why do I say that? Because the Knights Templar 
are the drug cartels down in Michoacan, Texas. And their specialty, if you will, is human organ harvesting. And you can go online and read the articles about how the people of Michoacan have had to become vigilantes of sorts to keep the drug cartels from, from kidnapping their children. Because they take them off the streets. They, take, they rent rooms and hotels and other places. They set up doctors and they make them harvest their organs and they sell their organs on a black market around the world. We're talking pure evil here, folks, but with only having operational control of our border. And as far as I know, there's only been a couple of cases of actual organ, organ harvesting in the United States, and they haven't tied it to the drug cartels yet. But if you can't stop what's happening at the border and across the border, what stops it from coming here? <coughs> The, the Sentinel cartels have three major hubs for drug distribution. The hubs are Phoenix, Denver, and Chicago. I'd be happy to give any of you my card and I'd send you over to PowerPoint with these maps that I'm talking about that have been produced by the DEA. Now I want you to consider this. The most deadly place in the world in terms of body count is Syria. They've been going, undergoing civil war. The second most deadly place in terms of body count is Mexico. But it's related directly to drug trafficking. Between the years, the Mexican government has released numbers, between the year 2007 and 2014, there have been 164,346 civilians killed by drug cartels. Compare that to Afghanistan of 21,000. Compare that to Iraq at 82,000. It's double the civilian deaths of Iraq. How many people do you know who still vacation in Mexico? Raise your hand. How many? Do any of you? You might want to consider going to Iraq. It's twice a good safer. Or Afghanistan. And I'm, and I'm very serious. In addition to this 164,365 people that have been killed between 2007 and 2014, and it hasn't stopped, there's 35,000 who were missing. Now they assume that they've been kidnapped by the cartel. And I, you hear stories when you get closer to the border, when you get down talking to people there, they have relatives who went missing. Some of them were engineers for Ford or other companies who were doing business in Mexico, and they believe that they were taken by the cartel. <coughs> so now let's talk about the growth in the unaccompanied alien miners who are coming to our border. Why is that important to take a look at who they are? Because this is not anything the media talks about. <coughs> well, when you talk about deadly places on Earth, we talked about <coughs> sheer body counts, but per capita population who are, who are Kill the civilians. The number one company, the number company, the number one country is El Salvador. The second country is Honduras. These are numbers of people. So this, these are the most actually, when it comes to per capita, per hundred thousand people, people who are killed. Number one is El Salvador. Two is Honduras. Three is Venezuela. Four is Guatemala. Number five is Mexico. Where are the unaccompanied minors and the people who are traveling here <coughs> from the border coming from? What they call the Northern Triangle of Central America. Who are these people? We don't know. Why are there so many youth coming here? We don't know that either. Who are they? We don't know that. We don't know anything about them. I can tell you <coughs> that the Center for Immigration Studies have, have done a study based on Border Patrol interviews and so on that during the height of the surge under the Obama administration, which was set off because he was talking about DACA. He was talking about legalizing <coughs> DACA. What is DACA? Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. He was talking about granting them an amnesty. 
He gave them DACA because Congress wouldn't. But he was talking about legalizing them and it set off this tsunami of people coming. And up to, from the point of, in 2011, they had 5,200 people, unaccompanied minors coming through our southern border, 5,200. By 2014, because he talked about DACA, it was up to 68,000. That's how fast it changed. So who are these people? Well, Center for Immigration Studies, as I started to say, has said more than 30% of them are MS-13. Are they coming up here because they want a better way of life? No. Clearly, they don't all have family members here. Many of them still have not been placed in the hands of family members. Some of them are in foster homes. Some of them are still in centers in different places. Is it possible? Yes, it is. Let me just tell you ahead of time that these people are fleeing their, some of these youth are fleeing their country because they've committed crimes. That their governments are running them out of El Salvador. Yes. Are some of these families who are coming fleeing the violence in these places? Absolutely. Who could blame them? But you have to ask yourself, if you're fleeing this violence, why would you then put yourself in the hands of the drug cartels to get you through Mexico? And what has the testimony been in Congress about what happens to these kids? What do these families know about placing their hands, these unaccompanied kids? Remember, about 90% of these kids are coming alone. Only 10% of them are actually coming with family members. <coughs> what, is, what is the testimony that has appeared in Congress? Well, Jay Johnson in 2014 said, quote, some of these family members give their children birth control because they know they're going to be raped along the way. Follow that up with testimony from Senator Dick Durbin. Samuel and Emily, when first in the hands of Health and Human Services, didn't open up. But after about two months of being in their care and custody, they admitted that they had both been raped by drug cartels. They were ages three and six. Oh, Makes me sick to my stomach. And so Congress immediately went into action, didn't they, and built the damn wall so that no other kids would want to come up there if their parents aren't smart enough to not put them in the hands of drug cartels. Where is the United States in the compassion, the real compassion, to stop this? There hasn't been any because you haven't heard this in the mainstream media. You haven't heard what these children may have to endure in their trip up here. And why have we done nothing? You hear the outrage down there by this fake news about how the children are being detained and taken away from their families. I just got through telling you, 10% of who's <coughs> going up in our border right now is coming with a supposed family member. But let me tell you this, I've been there and I've tested and I have right there in my briefcase, recorded testimony from social workers inside Southwest Keys detention facilities in Arizona, who said, we know these kids are being placed with people who aren't, who aren't their family members. That the drug cartels, as they're bringing them through Mexico, pick out, I want you and you and you. And when they get to the facility, they put them into the detention centers and then somebody with clean prints, what does that mean? Somebody who hasn't been picked up by the law. Illegal or legal doesn't matter. Somebody who has not had a brush with law enforcement can come and give them their fingerprints, and their, they do a background, and they have to take these people at their word that they're turning these kids loose to. So what would you have? What does that mean? What are these social workers saying? They're saying this is licensed trafficking because they're coming in such large numbers. Nobody knows. There's no way of proving that these kids belong to who they claim they're related to. Some of them stay with them, claim they're their parents. I was in <coughs> Laredo, Texas in 2006, and I'm taking a, a tour of the Border Patrol station there, and I kept seeing these pictures of a couple of kids in different parts of the station and it was the same faces over and over again. And I said, what's up with that? Who, who are these kids? Why are there pictures here? Well, <coughs> 
So you have, you have to understand our immigration law. If you come from Mexico, adult or child, you cross the border, we can process you and put you back immediately. But if you're what they call OTM, other than Mexican, means you've traveled through several countries, they have to give you a hearing, process you, make sure you have <coughs> the opportunity to claim asylum or tell them if you've been trafficked. But they kept seeing these pictures of kids, the Central American people know this, that if you show up with a child, we have no detention facilities for families. We still don't. So they would, so when you go into these, into the work patrol stations, they have the women in one big cell, they have the men in a big cell, and then they have the children over here. And the really little ones have to go somewhere else. Because they don't have facilities for families. So the Central Americans, and the pictures of these kids that I'm telling you about, knew that if they could show up at the border with any child who claimed this is their child, they would simply be given a notice to appear at some date in the future and turn loose into the United States, which is exactly what you hear some of the people in Washington, D.C. saying we need to do again. Well, these kids were, these, these children were rented by the Central Americans. They were babies and children of Mexican families. How they got these children back to the families in Mexico, we don't know, because Border Patrol was turning them over to the Mexican consulate in the United States, assuming that they were getting them back to their families. But it was the Border Patrol agents in the station that noticed these same kids were coming through over and over and over because they were being rented. So when we do the big separation down there, and it's this terrible thing, I think it's a good practice. Why? Because number one, we don't know if that person is really their parent. We don't know that they're not a drug cartel who has marked them to be trafficked. And it takes some time for these children, two months according to Senator Dick Durbin, to open up and see what really happened to them. So the idea of just putting these kids right back or keeping them with those parents, they're the adults they're traveling with isn't necessarily a good thing either. <clears throat> so, during the height of this chaos of the surge, the last surge, now we're feeling another surge. I'm not really sure, nobody's really sure why all of a sudden we're seeing these great numbers of at the southern border. Some people believe it's because they've been talking again about DACA. They just voted on another bill today. You can see they, they didn't get it accomplished. But every time we've done this, ever since 1986, 1986 was supposed to solve this problem, the first amnesty that we granted. It was only going to be about 2 million people. It turned out to be over 4. So they were off by 100%. And then we had the biggest rush. Now, so before 1986, it was mostly single men who would come up here. I was in Southern California at the time. They would come up here work, and then they would go home, and they would send their money home. But then after the amnesty, it was entire families who would come. It changed the dynamics completely. People who were hoping to come and stay and wait for the next amnesty, and many of them have been here. Of course, we had a series of different things that would allow them to adjust their status since then. <coughs> I don't remember exactly what the number was. I-145 or something that an employer could petition and sponsor them to, to become legal. That ended, though, in the Bush administration. Um, and so now there is no process for them to do that. Um, and the law says if you've been here up to a year illegally and you apply, um, you're barred from, from processing for three years. If you've been here more than a year and you try to apply legally, you go home, come, you don't apply legally, they're going to bar you from 10 year, for 10 years. Mm -hmm. So it's a punishment for having broken the law to begin with. <coughs> the bottom line is, folks, that during the height of this surge, <coughs> the Obama administration released from 2013 to 2015 195,900 criminal aliens from federal prison. These were convicted criminals of murder, kidnapping, 
sexual assault, go right down the list. These were not petty crimes, these were felonies. 193 of the people they released in 2013 alone had committed murder. They were serving time for murder. And he opened the doors and let them loose. Who is the Trump administration going after? Those hard criminals. So when you hear these people saying, oh, they're tearing families apart, they're doing this, they're doing that, if they happen to be tearing any families apart, it's because one of the guys that lives at that house is one of these guys, or one the 1.9 million criminal deportable aliens that we have in the United States. 1.9 criminal aliens living in the United States that need to be rounded up and deported. That's who the Trump administration is going after. With 6,000 officers to do removal, they don't have time for mom and pop. They're going after these guys. So this is nothing more than nonsense that you hear. So let me give you a snapshot of the criminals that he released, total of 36,007 in 2013. They had committed between them the 36,000, 88,000 crimes. Senator Grassley did a report, <coughs> went back and followed these criminals after they'd been released in 2015, and he did a report and they had already committed an 1,000 additional crimes. So let's get to the meat of what we're talking about here tonight. So I'm setting the stage for you to talk to you about who is coming here and the fact that they're coming in such large numbers and we don't know who they are. You have to understand if 30% of those alien unaccompanied minors, more than 30% were MS-13, they simply have placed them now in Baltimore, Washington, D.C., New York, Los Angeles, Chicago, and other cities that are already MS-13 strongholds. Go Google MS-13 and you will find out that they are considered some of the most violent, ruthless, and dangerous people walking on the face of the earth. In some cases, they're worse than the Middle Eastern terrorist organizations that we are so fearful of. You better fear MS-13. When I was in McNallum, Texas with the sheriffs, and we were going through the detention center there, the Border Patrol agents pointed out a little boy, and he said, you see that boy, he's 14 years old. He admitted to us he committed his first murder at the age of eight. Mm -hmm. The sheriffs turned to me, one of them, uh, Thomas Hodgson from Massachusetts, said, Susan, that's not a child in any sense of the word. He has a whole different life experience than we understand. And yet he would be placed in a detention facility and then possibly a foster home and then a local school. And have you guys been following what's happening in Maryland in this middle school where the MS-13 gang members have a concentrated presence in a middle school and they've basically taken a whole school, when I say hostage, they're not holding them hostage, but they're ruthless. And the kids in this middle school in Maryland are afraid to go to school. Go Google it. This is what's happening. Do you know that all the 9-11 hijackers were illegally in this country by the time they committed that crime. They had all came legally, but had adjusted or fallen out of status somehow. Many of them had brushes with law enforcement, should have been deported, but when you don't have local law enforcement speaking with federal officers, how are you going to know? Let's face it, the local officers, your officers in the streets of Santa Rosa and your town sheriffs, are much more likely to have a brush with one of these bad guys doing during local law enforcement than any federal immigration officer. But if they're not allowed to speak or share information, how are they going to protect you? How are you going to know? If they're not allowed to go on the system or ask guys, hey, do you know who this guy is? If they're not talking, they're not going to know if it's even a terrorist. So think about it. It threatens national security because it stops communication with all federal officials. Creates enclaves for terrorists and for criminals. Because the law enforcement officer 
having gone through post-training in the state of California, criminals take the path of least resistance. Why do you think the guy who killed Kate Steinle was back in San Francisco after being deported five times? Because he knew if he committed some petty crime, he wasn't going to be turned over to ICE. He was going to be back on the streets. <coughs> so these are dangerous myths. Sanctuary encourages illegal alien victims to cooperate with police and by sharing information. Number one, most of them don't trust the police. Their experience with police in their countries has been one of corruption. And also, the many, in many cases, um, the police have been tools of oppression for them, not somebody that they can trust. Gang members threaten retribution if they tell on them anyway. So when they're in these neighborhoods and one of them commits a crime and it's been done by some MS-13 gang member, they're not going to go share that information with the police. What happens to them later is much worse. So they don't, they don't share that information. And then think about this, sanctuary laws. If I'm going to report a criminal, and I know the city or the county I live in, enforces some laws, but not others, am I going to trust them to enforce the law I'm reporting, the crime that I'm reporting? Because sanctuary policies do just that. States, cities, and counties who pass them say, this isn't an important law. I'm not going to enforce it. I'm not going to cooperate. That's exactly what the state of California has done. They've set up a law for you, and a law for somebody who's here illegally. You can work. You don't have to have a social security number. You don't have to pay taxes. You can get a driver's license. You can go to college. We'll pay your tuition. You can commit a crime, and we're not going to turn you over to the federal government. Think about it. This is what the state of California has done. Sanctuary policy is bad for everyone. There's not. So here's the story. Oh, if they don't feel like they can report the crime, they're going to get deported. There's not one documented case of an illegal alien or anybody out of status who's reported a crime and then been deported solely because they reported a crime. Not one. And yet, how many times have you heard that story told? Not one. So when you hear that, you say, prove it. Bring me the case. I want to see the case. I want to know the name because it doesn't exist. <coughs> Sanctuary policies, even in the city of San Francisco, does not protect someone from being deployed. They hide them from law enforcement. They become an un enclave, a place they can hide. <laughs> but if ICE wants to pick somebody up, they're going to the city of San Francisco. They're going to find them, and they're going to deport them. They're going to wait until they're released from jail, and then they're going to pick them up from the street. That's happening all over your state, in case you don't know. ICE is having to find out, and people inside those jails, a lot of law enforcement are leaking information, saying so-and-so is coming out on the other side of the state, and they're standing on the street and waiting for them. So sanctuary policies really don't protect them from being deported, because the state of California doesn't have the ability to pass that kind of law. And actually, just the opposite is true. So here's the truth. There are a number, number of visas that can be given to someone who reports a crime and helps in that prosecution to legalize their status. So if there is someone in the community who is undocumented, who has witnessed a crime and comes forth, the, the police organization who's processing that can help them apply for a visa for legal status. So there's actually more encouragement for them to cooperate through the real channels with the federal government than there is to not cooperate. So do you see the myths, the lies that are being told about how this whole process works? <coughs> Women who are battered by their husbands can come forward. <coughs> So sanctuary policy simply increases criminal activity. And the truth is the Bureau of Justice has shown that 68% of people who are released from jail are rearrested within three years. 
77% within five years. <coughs> in cooperation with ICE would also re result in fewer people being victimized. And think about this. The estimation is the city of San Francisco alone releases about 600 people a year. It should be turned over to federal ICE officers to be removed. How many other cities do the same thing? Los Angeles, Chicago, New York, um, you know, on and on it goes. So multiply that, we have thousands of people that are being shielded by the big cities in this, in this country who should be deported. And we've already seen the results of what happens with the death of the Bologna family in San Francisco. That was a, an alien who had been deported, who killed a family of three, had had a brush with law enforcement the night before, but because he was here illegally, he was released, killed a family the next day. Drew Rosenberg, who was run over and killed, Kate Steinle. Deportation doesn't seem like a solution. Well, deportation isn't a solution if you don't do something then to secure the border so they can't come back again. Right? Exactly. So, you know, if you can't, if you got, I don't know, what would you have? Right now we have about one border patrol agent. There's 19,000 for 7,500 miles of border, and we're talking 24 hours a day, so, you know, that full 19,000 aren't on shift at any one time. We're talking about one border patrol agent for 10, 15 miles of border. You know, come on. Right. It is hard to blame someone from Mexico or South America or Timbuktu, honestly, China, anywhere, because people come here from all over the world and try to get through here and do get through here illegally. We have lots of people who come here on visitor visas and never go home from China, <coughs> India. Go down the list. But the bottom line is, how, how, how do you hold them? How, it's not just their fault when you have employers who will give them jobs and violate the law too, and they're not prosecuted. Why hasn't that happened? Because frankly, that's who I really lay yeah. this squarely on the back of, is the people who hire them. All right, so let me tell you a story I know for a fact, because I know the family. In Omaha, Nebraska, there was a roofing company working on a house next door. They had, their entire crew was illegal aliens. And one of the guys, the guy who committed this particular crime, had only been in the United States one week. One week, he went out to the local bar, he got drunk. He wanted to find a woman to have sex with, and the women in the bar turned him down. So he was angry. He went back and knew some women lived in the house next door to where they were putting this roof on. He broke into the house, he was drunk, and he raped. 93-year-old Louise Solomon, and he beat her as he raped her. And she was near death when her daughter finally heard what was going on. Her daughter, who was 60-some years old, came in, and he had passed out on top of Louise. She called the police, and when the police got there, they pulled him off. There was blood on the ceiling. He had beaten her so severely, she never regained consciousness. She died the next day. And Bill Hartzell, her son-in-law, was called by the police. He came in as the guy was still sitting there on the floor, hadn't had any clue about what had just taken place. He said he's, he's a licensed concealed carry. Had he been told, he said, I swear to you, I would have killed him. He's still serving time in Omaha, Nebraska. This guy was on the crew of her neighbor house. Her life was taken. It is, a, it is the most brutal, gruesome thing, and to deal with a family who's gone through that kind of trauma is unbelievable. But the bottom line is, if that employer hadn't hired him, which he was known to do, because when you hire illegal aliens, guess what? You can undercut the other guys in the weapon business. We've seen that over and over here in the state of California. Well, they're on public services. 
So it's not as if, I mean, you know, that is compared by that. I mean, a lot of illegals are on public services. Yeah, they earn a heck of a lot of money. You mean on welfare services? Well, let me tell you, they're not entitled to welfare services. Their children are, if they're born here, or children under a certain age are entitled to certain welfare benefits, whether they're citizens or not. Let me just tell you, our legal arm, which is the Immigration Reform Law Institute Fair, has filed an amicus brief on behalf of the Department of Justice supporting the fact that they sued the state of California. So that's what we have done. And we're busy trying to find other counties and cities who want to step up and say, this is bad public policy, this is bad law. And in fact, what you have to understand here the state of California has done is they have, they are forcing cities and employers, because employers aren't allowed to do certain things either under AB 450. They have violated their constitutional rights this isn't an issue of 10th Amendment, but this is a, a, an issue that is just strictly in the purview of the state. The only people who have jurisdiction over any kind of immigration is the United States federal government, period. So we have filed a, uh, an amicus brief. We represent the National Sheriff's Association on that brief. And we have cities in Southern California who have asked to join us, and we're asking you to help us find other counties and cities who want to push back because this is bad <coughs> But here's the two questions I want you to really ponder tonight. If you don't take anything else away, take this. Ask yourself and ask public officials who benefits from AB 450 and SB 54. Who benefits? I want to hear you tonight. Think it, think it through when you think you're going what? SB 54 and the AB 450. Employers and Democrats. Okay. Why? Who did you say? Employers and Democrats. How do they benefit from a sanctuary law that will not deport a criminal alien? Well, the employer is going to benefit because they can employ these folks, and if you don't check them out if they're working on your house, then they're going to undercut. Okay, but a lot of employers wouldn't employ them if they knew they were well, they criminals. Have, so I, who, who does this bill really, who does it benefit? Who was it written for? So here's the thing. In law, when you're in a city or a county or even a state, the first thing you do is you say, we have a problem. And we need to write a law that fixes this problem. So the intent of the law is to do whatever that is. What is the intent <coughs> of these laws? Who benefits from it? Yes? The electoral uh, votes per state is based on population. Okay, okay. So Except they're so talking about maybe changing that. So that's really not who it benefits well, this is by having sanctuary. Sanctuary policy specifically only addresses a certain population. Who is that population? Not all the illegals. Criminals. Criminals. Criminal illegal aliens are the only ones who benefit from these two laws. Because the first requirement is they have to be in the hands of local law enforcement. This doesn't say anything about you can't go out and search and find illegal aliens. They don't do that anyway. Nobody has the time to do that in the state of California. You have plenty of homegrown criminals that you don't have time to, to go out and do that. So the intent of this law is to frustrate federal enforcement officers from being able to do their job even to the point of possibly armed confrontation. And did we not see that in Marietta, where the local law enforcement were there protecting protesters. They were bringing in a bus, Border Patrol. <coughs> they were going to turn <coughs> on some of these uh, people that had been at the detention facilities. And the people were protesting, and the Border Patrol agents got out of the bus and actually put their hands on their guns. And the local law enforcement officers all went for their guns. So it's a pretty tense situation. Was anybody down there? I was in Sacramento last week and some people said that they were there. <coughs> but, but again, so you've got, you've got local law enforcement being pit against federal law enforcement officials doing their jobs. So, so who benefits is a criminal illegal alien? Here's question number two. What does AB 450 and SB 54 accomplish? What does this law accomplish? Pardon? Votes? No. No. That's not to do with votes. It's sanctuary. 
nullifies immigration law? It puts criminal aliens back on the street. But why would we That's want that? Why would we want that? Why? Who benefits from this? Right. Who benefits from this? Ask yourself that Nobody. question. Nobody. Well, let me go, well, yeah. Nobody. Drug cartels who have drug dealers here in the state of California who are doing a drug deal and they get busted tomorrow. I go before a judge. They're going to get whatever they give them, which has gotten more lenient, more lenient over the years. You know, if they haven't been busted before, maybe they're going to get a couple months in jail. Maybe they're going to just get probation. I've seen people doing horrible things in the state of California. They're simply getting probation. So now what happens to that guy after he goes before the judge? He's put back on the streets. He doesn't have to. He's not going to get deported to Mexico, and the drug cartel doesn't have to try to haul him back up here again. He's immediately <coughs> redeployed on the streets doing but drug deals. But has to change hands somewhere, because I can't see anybody wanting to Bingo. do that unless Bingo. the cartel has somebody. There you go. Who benefits from this? Follow the money. Who, who, it? who does it benefit, and what does it accomplish? It simply accomplishes putting these people back on the streets instead of deporting them out of our country. So you ask yourself, what criminal community benefits the most from this law? Because I'm telling you, you don't write laws like this unless somebody is benefiting from it. Right, well, yes. so tell us. So I say, I suspect, as you do here tonight, that there is some criminal enterprise at work in the state of California who benefits from these laws or they wouldn't have been written. That nobody in their right mind who is a government official writes law like this unless somebody is influencing them. And if you watch the legislature of the state of California, they have written law after law after law that makes it easy for illegal immigration, illegal immigrants, and in particular criminals, drive on the streets, get back on the streets, in-state tuition, oh, and now they roll out the red carpet. Who, yeah. where is that good policy, government policy, in any place in the world who does this? Is it Kevin De Leon, Senator Laura, both of them, children of illegal aliens, are now very influential people in your state legislature. Come on, guys, I mean, you really need to look and, and do a study of these people. I don't know who's influencing them. I'm just telling you from a law enforcement background, and it's really simple deduction. You say to yourself, who benefits from this legislation? Criminal aliens. That's it. Not, not mom and dad who are just here illegally. If they're not in the hands of law enforcement for some other reason, they're never going to be turned over to federal agents, are they? This is strictly about people who are in the hands of law enforcement already because they've done something wrong. So you guys need to educate yourselves, and you need to educate other people. And you need to look at this through a really, really open mind and ask yourself those questions. And ask somebody who says they support sanctuary, ask them, who does it benefit? I've spent too many trips down the border. I've talked to too many experts. Um, the people who did all of the gang wars, uh, drug wars, for History Channel, the experts that they use, I know them all. I've talked to them all. Nobody believes for a second that the drug cartels aren't in charge of Mexico. That whatever we see of any form of government is strictly a figurehead. That there's no actual control anymore in Mexico that it is run by the drug cartels. That's what all of the experts I have spoken to believe. So I don't know that to be a fact, and I don't know who this guy is, but <coughs> when you have police chiefs who are murdered one right after another in town who think they're going to clean it up, and the drug cartels simply say, no, you're not.